Best ever listeners, welcome back to the best ever listeners. Welcome to the best real estate investing advice ever show. I'm Slocum Reed and I'm here with Jason Yerusi. Jason is joining us from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. He's the founder and managing partner of Yerusi Holdings, currently a GP of over 1300 units across 15 properties and a third time best ever podcast guest. His other episodes were 1538 and 1788. Jason, can you start us off with uh, what you've been doing since the last thousand episodes aired uh, and what you're currently focused on? Yeah, sure. Thanks so much for having me on the show. And I'll note, I actually got to host a show with uh, Theo uh, back in the day as well, which was pretty fun as well. So excited to be back. Nice. Um, yeah, the bio, we actually would probably need to update a little bit. Um, we are coming up about 17, 1800 units right now. Um, some acquired, some will be closing soon and another about a hundred million of development in the works across three properties. Um, we moved down to Tennessee about two years ago, grew up in New Jersey, lived in New York city, transitioned down here just to have a change of life with the family. It's been great. Uh, most of the properties we invest in are down here in these core markets, uh, Atlanta, Nashville, and Louisville. Uh, we are owner operators here. We do syndicate out on our projects in Georgia of them. Um, we're just looking for underperforming assets, whether it's on the building or the management side, typically you find one, you find the other. Um, and we've been pretty active uh, in the last three to six months. Very active in the last three to six months. You know, Jason, um, we can't assume our audience, the best ever listeners, our audience has grown a lot the last, the last three years. Uh, since you were last on the podcast. So we can't assume that everyone knows your story, but I want to be able to dive into what you're currently working on. Uh, when you say you've been really active the last three to six months, what does that mean? Sure. So started back in multifamily in 2016. First acquisition was in 2017. Uh, prior to that, we were in the single family space for about three to four years. And uh, prior to that, uh, we we actually owned and operated uh, some bars and some restaurants in New York City. At one time, it opened a brewery that I sold in New York City. So we made the transition as we were just, uh, my wife, Peely, who was my partner here at University Holdings and myself, wanted to just get back to something that we could do to create time and create the day we wanted, right? And so our children, of course, we have three of them now at the time that we started on this journey. Uh, my wife, Peely, was pregnant with our first. He's now seven, coming on eight. And we were so busy within a construction business we were running, coming out of the bar world, but we had to just be active to get back, right? So, so just like many service worlds, if you're not doing, you're not getting paid, right? And so that had continued on route. We knew working late nights was not going to be the way to, to really grow the family element we wanted. So we wanted to find what else was out there. Single family is great, but we found very quickly that we were adding on another job. We were adding on another thing that just kept busy activity, right? So we were doing all this on top of construction. Here we are doing flipping, wholesaling, Airbnbs. Um, but what it did allow us to do is to, to find better questions to ask. And we came upon uh, investing out of state in small rentals, two, three, and four units, um, really loved the space, but just really felt capped, right? Felt capped on what was the potential to be able to grow, to get to the level we wanted to, to be able to get back again our time. Um, was introduced to large apartment investing back in that 2016. Um, really dove in, sold off those smaller properties, learned as much as we could, surrounded ourselves with other great people, and dove in, went from those three to four units up to a 94 unit for that first uh, acquisition there. And then over the course of the last five, six years now, we've really doubled down the space. The last three to six months, which, which, which has really accelerated our pace, is just the ability to bring on great team members, right? So, so we have, we've been growing our team, expanding our team, and I've just found dynamic people, right? Because just our path forward to just make places better places to live, which always trends back to, of course, make it a better place for the tenants, which makes the property perform better because those tenants, instead of just using it as a place to pass through, treat it like their home, right? Because now they, they know there's a group looking to improve it and take care of it. So which trends down to the bottom line, which ultimately produces better returns for our investors. And we've found that our process was being capped by, by Peely and myself, right? Because as much as you want to think it, um, you trying to do more 
sometimes produces less results. So we've been able to bring on great team members, uh, has really helped us grow, um, grow our plan, grow our process, and just help more people. That's awesome. So 17, 1800 units, the last, um, you've been very active, uh, and it sounds like you've been very active in a time that has been um, uh, a time that brings some hesitation to multifamily syndication with increasing interest rates uh, and the possibility of expanding cap rates. Um, while still being active in acquisitions, Jason, what are you doing right? How, what, how are you changing, if you are changing, the way that you're looking at the deals you want to do right now, given it's early June 2022, given the current economic uh, and commercial real estate um, market that we're seeing? Sure. So, so of those units we've acquired, we've actually gone full cycle on, a, on eight of them now with the ninth one coming up. And so we've had a lot that, that we've transitioned out of that was, um, I'll call it premature, but early in our whole period, we, we took advantage of just um, how far we were able to get ahead of the business plan and then couple that with, with what was some of the economics happening in the market. We took advantage of it. Um, that noting into what we're going today, we've also moved where traditionally a lot of those buildings were more C-oriented or C-class oriented, um, good markets. However, um, we're, we're more exposed uh, to the elements, right? Inflation really hitting someone's, someone's pocket. Um, a lot more in that space where they're living at, at a much more week to week basis. We've transitioned into areas that, that weren't um, a step up in tenant base. Uh, we've really dialed in. Part of the reason that we're here is one, we love it here in Tennessee. However, we, we really love the Nashville MSA. We've stayed, we've stayed really market focused. Um, we're really highly positioned and focused on the Nashville MSA. We're not going to Memphis. We're not going to Chattanooga. We're not going to Clarksville. We're really honing down and dialing in here and finding our space in the places that we feel have a, have a good runway, um, have good insulation to uh, sustain very well based on the dynamics of the market, the job growth, the job diversity, the amount of people coming into the market here, and just the lack of supply. Um, you know, across the nation, we were at a point here on average, we were about 0.8 months of housing available, right? Uh, you know, Nashville was trending about 0.7 months at the time. Murfreesboro, where I do live today, um, very insulated multifamily market. Uh, the, uh, the RM zoning, which, which enables how many units, uh, the density for, for the area here has actually gotten downsized because of the sewer allocation. Um, it's been been on the top list uh, for Tennessee of fastest growing cities here, and they can't keep pace, right? Our properties that we have here currently, um, we're, we're at 100%, even though we keep pushing our rents up and we're ahead. Uh, we're about a year, year and a half ahead on our pro forma rents based on what's happened here. However, the, the, each time we step that up, um, we're finding that occupancy stays true at a, at a close to or near 100%, right? So we're talking 2% vacancy. It's basically a, a zero on, on the vacancy there. So we found that this market in part with having very strong teams surrounding us puts us in a good place to go out there and look. We've also looked for debt that didn't put us in... Um, great exposure where, where we'll say two years or three years out from now, we're going to be pushed to make a decision on trying to transfer out of the property as well. So we were really looking for good debt partners right now that we can pair that on properties that we want to be in for seven, eight, nine years, because we want to stay in the market where it's not something where a lot of the early, earlier ones have been earlier exits based on what's happened in the market, where we, it's almost like we'll call it a longer term flip the building because of just how the transition period went from a five to seven year hold into a one, two, three year hold. You, uh, you've said a lot in the last couple of minutes there, Jason, there are a couple of things that stood out to me though, uh, as seemingly contradict, uh, contradicting to what most people I interview are thinking or doing. I'll start with the second one that you mentioned. You're focusing on long-term debt. This is Joe Fairless's best ever podcast. In his best ever book, he said that, you know, one of the core principles of apartment syndication is secure long-term fixed rate debt. That being said, given the debt market that we're seeing right now, the, the gap between long-term debt and bridge debt is widening. 
And some people think that makes bridge debt look juicier because they believe they're going to be in a position to turn uh, to turn their property around in three years. You know, they they expect that what's happening with interest rates right now won't last that long, um, that the interest rates will lower three years from now. And so they'd rather go ahead and fix that interest rate two percentage points lower for the next three years than uh, than stick with the long term debt they've always gone for now that it's so much more expensive. What are your thoughts on that? So great points. Um, I'll note uh, a couple things in there. So traditionally, over time, um, going for a floating rate over a five and 10 year horizon has outperformed um, staying in fixed rate, right? And just because a lot of times the uh, it's like the chess move, like the fear of the chess move actually produces more than the actual move itself, where they just the Fed is saying that they're going to increase rates. Uh, it's almost it's almost uh, it purchased in or, or uh, priced in right now to the current rates. Now, the, the point of that is you can go longer term debt with more potential back-end opportunities, right? So there are banks out there right now that, that are lending on their balance sheet or other points, right? So we have one right now where we're getting five-year fixed, um, not far off where we're seeing the floating rate where we don't have a prepayment penalty to be able to source out of it, right? So it's, it puts us in a position to have five-year money, five-year term, although the amortization is going to come down to 25, it still works very well for the deal. And it doesn't lock us in where we have a potential big um, exit penalty if we want to get out to that deal early. On the other side of it, we found that cap rates are, I'm sorry, um, uh, uh, interest caps have been so expensive based where they priced into that you have to say, okay, you know, I, I'm going to have to figure out something two years from now with the interest cap. So it does go the opposite way or, but is it the cost of going into that interest cap as a make up for just paying a little bit more um, for the fixed rate right now? So we're looking at both of those sides and we found earlier when we were doing some bridge product, it's worked well for those. However, we've transitioned into more um, sleep better at night money for some of these properties here that will trend better to this investment that we're going forward into, but still gives us the option going out. Now, the, the point about this is being short-lived, um, yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, we've even seen Freddie uh, Mac, their small balance has now put a reduction out there, right? Because a lot of this scarcity we've seen, you know, everybody overreacts and then calms and then takes a step back. Uh, but Fannie and Freddie themselves, you know, they, they have to put money out there. And right now they're probably so far behind this year and how much money they need to put to work that you're going to find other things happening out there that's going to make these deals better, right? Depending on what, of what they are. So we haven't gone agency in quite some time now. We did the majority of our earlier deals in agency. We haven't been there for a while. We've gone bridge, bank, credit union, you know, all, all different parts of the narrative here. Um, but we are looking back at agency now based on where we think that might go compared to some of the other debt options out there. Sticking on this point, Jason, you said uh, that you're going for sleep better at night debt right now. Is that is that because that is what the property and the deal uh, necessitate, or is that really more about what your investors are looking for, given that the economy is more tumultuous right now than it has been uh, the last several years? You know, it's not so much the deal that we're forced to go to the bridge. We've been trying to stay away from deals that are very um, skinny, you know, and we, we, even from core principles throughout, right? So, so one deal, for instance, we're buying here in Nashville, you know, price per pound is expensive, but it's a product that we could see ourselves holding for, for a decade, right? It's a great area. Um, very desirable area. They're selling houses, uh, you know, across the street, um, eight hundred thousand up to one point two million, right? So it's it's a prime area for us to be in. Um, however, we're we're saying okay, um, the the bridge option with where potentially SOFR will go and where, how expensive the caps are, um, it's going to crush cash flow potentially where we go out there. Where if I can predictably set an income stream at least for, for the future. The sleep better at night money is that I'm not going to be more exposed to the ups and downs that could exist out there. That's going to limit our cash flow out of the gate because we do have a, a, a sizable proven gap by, by our comps there, but it takes a minute for us to get there in terms of our rent bumps. Are you seeing that? Um, well, let me take a step back, Jason. Uh, you are uh, an operating 
principal in the majority of your deals, uh, your acquisitions, your operations, your also investor relations. So are you seeing in your investor relations that the appetite of your investors is changing right now? A couple of things to consider, um, given what's going on, uh, a bit more frame of reference for our audience. Um, there's a lot of money on the sidelines because a lot of people who invest in apartment syndications have seen major windfalls, you know, higher equity multiples and shorter hold periods for the last several years than were expected. So they're sitting on cash and the market is starting um, to show some cracks in the foundation. What are, what are your, what are you seeing from your investors with regards to their appetite right now? Sure. Yeah. So you trend on two sides, right? Typically, if it's if it's if it's real heavy on deals, the, the it means the market is um, tightened up on the money supply, right? And when if we're real heavy on the money, like we saw for the last couple of years, there deals are really hard to come by or more competitive, right? And so on that front, we're trending to that element there. However, noting where the stock market is, it's it's going from you know, a lot of people pull out from intangible assets, right? So, so we're pushing away from crypto, pushing away from stocks, just on the unpredictability uh, and just how much they've been hammered in the market. And they want to be in assets here that focus well on in with inflation, right? With the inflationary narrative here. Because if you think about this point, like real estate's a good hedge, they say for inflation. Well, there's certain asset classes that really trend better and multifamily really does well. If you look at it, you know, as we go out here, inflation, the more inflation we have, you know, typically it, it makes buildings, of course, cost more to build, materials cost more, labor costs more. And then when you go into really um, supply constrained areas like we have here, it, it's slower for these uh, to come up to meet that demand. On the same side, we're more predictable because of short term leases, year leases here that we can adapt to all these market changes more readily, whether it's up or down, right? Hopefully not down, but whether it's up and down. Um, and we're tracking on two points how the area, the property itself is adapting to, to wage inflation. Because we, we've seen such a rise up in price inflation now, but the wage inflation is really what we want to pay attention to because that's showing how much the tenant base can sustain, right? Because we have to be reasonable to say that here we are, you know, raising rents. Like, sure, we can prove it out with comps, but like, what's it going to do to our property? Will our tenant base be able to renew at some point and stay there? Or are we going to basically outprice the market? So noting that we've had a core group of investors um, that, that have done well with us, that we continue to, to talk to and keep them abreast and be very good with, with our response to them. You know, there are going to be some that, that want to be safe in terms of putting their money in real estate. And there'll be others that um, will choose um, that they want to wait it out, right? And we want it to be the best decision for investors. So we're fine either way. And it's going to be more to their investment parts. We find that in, in most lights, the ability to benefit from cash flow, appreciation, depreciation, debt pay down, tax advantages, uh, all of those that, that come with the multifamily housing far outweigh sitting on the sideline where your money's in a bank account and losing 10% just basically sitting there for the last year, right? So you look at that, you say, okay, if I can get something that's cash flowing and give me a lot of offsets, you know, tax advantages, it makes good sense if I believe in the area, if I believe in the operator and the team that's putting forward the investment. Are you seeing then, um, are, are you seeing a lot of your investors choosing to uh, take their chips off the table right now and sit on the sidelines? No, actually not. Um, I'm not seeing a big part of investors trend back. There is that group and completely understand, right? But the same thing too, when you look back, even just on early COVID, you know, one of the things we did is we, we actually had purchased property almost a month before, you know, like March 13th, right? Not, not known um, that property, you know, lo and behold, performed amazing, right? Because of everything that happened. However, a month in to, you know, April or so, we, we actually got under contract a property um, here locally and we couldn't in best conscious uh, effort say to our investors that this was the right time, right? So we actually walked away from that deal, just noting of everything, all the uncertainty at that time, you know, noting what we know now, you know, we missed out on a tremendous opportunity, right? Because of all the pieces. So hindsight's always 2020, 
but you know, we want people to be up for their best decision, whether now is the right time to invest with them or them or invest or not. Um, we have a good group of investors that continue to move. We actually have another one property that's selling in about two weeks. We have another property that looks to be going under contract to sell, right? So there's still an appetite on the buyer side out there as well. Um, but we have not seen a massive we'll say pullback from our investor base, but there's always some, and, and that could be, you know, some are marketing and some are just anything else, right? They've started their own business. They've done something else out there that's, that's productively using their money. Jason, um, you said earlier on in this episode that uh, you've decided to hone in specifically on Nashville. I was asking you, I was asking you how you are adapting your strategy and your underwriting to the current market conditions when you said so. Um, are you, you know, you, you mentioned the peri- uh, markets on the periphery of Nashville that you're not even considering right now, focusing on Nashville. You know, I think the vast majority of our listeners recognize how much growth there's been in the Nashville MSA. So that's not going to come as a surprise. However, Deals are fewer and farther and further between, and um, and you're deciding to zero in on one market at a time when most investors are looking into multiple markets in order to get deal flow. Why just Nashville? So Nashville, remember, we have the 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 outer core too, right? So so Nashville is Davidson County. You know, uh, beneath it, we have Williamson County, where we are is Rutherford County. Uh, we have Wilson County. So that that incorporates a lot of the area here that makes up the MSA for which areas we believe in. And so even below us is right here in Coffee County. Um, noting the the difficulty and just how much demand exists out there and how little supply. That's why we looked into development. Um, we come from a long, long history of construction. Um, we found two properties that are very well situated here, one entitled, the other one uh, we were able to walk into um, the, right as entitlement happened. And we actually just um, recently found another one here where, where it was a house um, that is owned accordingly for, for apartments here. Um, so noting if we can walk in there and help meet the gap of the need of housing, that gives us more opportunities. Now, of course, um, we would like to to buy existing product, right? It has less uh, less downside risk, less other points of of need. But we also are again looking for the delta between just the cost to buy versus the cost to build, and we continue to see that gap. Well, even with inflation, you know, the the, the gap continues to shorten on some of these areas about how much it costs to buy something compared to how much it costs to build. So if we can control that piece of the puzzle here and even be more open on our exit, right? So we, we get, uh, you know, we've had offers come in just, just basically buying the dirt from us at where it's at, or even for uh, them to buy the dirt and still have us do some of the infrastructure, right? So there's multiple exit strategies. So as long as you don't say stay stuck or agnostic just to one spot, you can see that although we're in one area, we're very adaptable to the multifamily space to make sure we're meeting accordingly. Because you go to multiple markets here, um, you also, well, it, it can be great, but I also see uh, the, the risk of not being prepared to how that market is changing, right? Because a lot of things can happen very quickly. You know, in Louisville, funny enough, within two years, we, we've done so well because the market took unpredictable changes in good ways, right? And so that's worked to our favor here, but you can't predict if that could happen in the wrong way too. And the more dialed in you can be to your area, the more opportunities you can have to win those markets. Jason, I know you've been on uh, this podcast a couple times before, uh, but it has been a little while. Are you ready for the best ever lightning round? I can. Yep. And you've done a great job. So, so Joe's got challenges coming up on him. So, well, I appreciate it. We'll see if he ever comes back and interviews anyone. What is the best ever book you've recently read, Jason? Uh, you know, I actually just uh, finished out Gary Vee's 12 and a half. Uh, fun book, right? Fun book just about talking about just really accountability, taking control of your emotion, just understanding how to just have the best path forward so you can be your best uh, self, but also be in the best position to help others one. You said that was 12 and a half? I th- I, yeah, yeah, 12 and a half. It's Gary Vanderchuk, uh, but I'm pretty sure it's 12 and a half is the name of the book. 
Gotcha. What's your best ever way to give back? You know, we, we've done a lot in um, some charity organizations that, that we really have. One's called Imagine that we like to, to work with. Uh, we also have this seven-figure uh, multifamily mastermind where we have a bunch of people that are looking to do the same thing we have, that we've helped others now go out there and just, just change the direction of where they want to be. So between the two, um, it takes a lot of energy and we uh, love to uh, go out there and just show our kids just other ways that, that we can all win together in this world that hopefully they can pass them on as well. In the last, since the last time you were on the show, Jason, what is the biggest mistake you've made and the best ever lesson you've learned resulting from it? Hmm. I wish I talked on hiring earlier, right? I, you know, and that, that's a big part here is that you, we all want to assume that we can do it, the, the, everything the best ourselves. Um, rarely ever true, right? But let's just say even you can. If there's one of you and you have to do 10 things, you're probably going to get two done at hundred percent, the rest are going to be done at 10%, right? So although maybe in a magical world, you can do everything better, which probably you can't ultimately, well, those eight things got done you know, at 10% of what they need to be done. Um, so we've really honed down and finding great people. We want to continue to scale. I have a great team surrounding us now. I'm so excited on the path forward and just so excited on, on how they come engaged every day to do better. So biggest mistake is just waiting too long for things um, to really bring people on that we can all help each other do great together. Jason, what is your best ever advice? Man, get started, right? Get started. Uh, everything I've done in my life, uh, I, I used to younger, always trying to figure everything else out. And then you start and realize the first thing that happens is you realize you don't know any of the, the questions or answers basically because you just started and got smacked in the face, right? So get started. Multifamily space, if, you, if this is where you want to be, um, you can listen to this podcast here. You get a ton of true value, but you have to get out there. Go to meetings, talk to people. Go out there and find other people that are doing it. Ask if you can have time to speak with them. Go out there and find positions that you can involve yourself or engage or add value to others. But the, the get started component, like no one ever looks back 50 years from now and said, you know, I wish I did left, less. Or, you know, I wish I just, you know, no, everybody always says, I wish I did something earlier. I wish I took action. I wish I tried. The ability to, to fail is, is something that scares us all. But if failure is, is a natural way for us to learn what not to do, to do again and learn from our mistakes. So go forward, try. You will find that the downside risk of what you try is so minimal from the upside potential because we always assume that the worst case scenario is going to happen. You know, the worst possible thing is going to happen. But if you're going to give merit for the worst possible thing going to be able to happen, you have to get credit that the best possible thing can also happen. Awesome. Jason, where can people get in touch with you? Sure. You can go over to yerusiholdings.com, everything over there from talking about the mastermind to our podcast, to our offerings, to what we've been working on, to a little bit more about Peely and I. So everything there at yerusiholdings.com. And thank you so much for having me back in the show. Absolutely, Jason. Thank you for coming back. And the link, that link is going to be in the show notes. Best ever listeners, thank you as well for tuning in. If you've gained value from this episode, please do subscribe to the show. Give us a five-star review and share this with a friend you know we can add value to through this episode. Thank you and have a best ever day.